So what do developers like best? Coffee, beer, or free software? My name is John Mad Dog Hall. I'm the board chair of the Linux Professional Institute and the president of Linux International. For those of you who do not know me, I've been in the computer industry for about 50 years, since 1969. I've worked for a lot of large and small companies. I've had a wide variety of different jobs, including being a programmer and a systems administrator. But one of the things I value the most about my job is that I am pragmatic, which means that I want to get the job done. And I happen to think that free software is the best way of doing that. So what do programmers really value? Money, let's face it. I mean, I'll be honest with you, money is a big thing, but in most programming jobs today, money is kind of a given. People will receive money according to what the boss thinks they're worth, what the market thinks they're worth. And if you don't like the amount of money you get, well, then you go on to another job. But if you go beyond that, there's a lot of things that programmers also value. And sometimes they value it even more than money. They'll leave a job that has greater amount of money for a job with lesser amount of money if some of these things happen. And so there was an organization that did a very large survey. That's the URL of the survey. And they asked people, what do you value? And then they took the input of that and sorted it and organized it and then presented it to two different groups, dev.to and Hacker News. And they said, please order all of these things into the order that you value them. And so the most amazing thing that they found was of the two groups, they came up with exactly the, the three items at the top for both of them. They were in the same order, given the same way, with no collaboration between them. So the first thing that both groups wanted was a good work-life balance. They wanted to be able to work. They liked working. They liked programming. But they also wanted to have time for other things, their hobbies, to see friends, to drink beer, <laughs> to have a good time. And they wanted to be able to balance these two things, not work all the time but work enough to be productive. The second thing is that they valued a high quality code base to work with because they realized that having this high quality code base allowed them to generate uh, their own code very quickly and to be able to maintain it. They also liked flexible work arrangements. They like to be able to come in maybe early in the morning and leave early because they wanted to do some sports or they wanted to come in late and leave late because that's just the way they liked working. Or sometimes they wanted to work on the weekends because it was quieter. So they wanted the work arrangements to be flexible. Now, after this, they started to deviate a little bit. But as you can see, some of the items, like having a diverse team, was important to both groups of programmers. They also wanted to be able to have something that allowed them to be ideal for parents. So if they had children, to be able to spend some time with their children or maybe have some daycare for their children or things like that. And the reason we're going over all of these is because you as a programmer or as a systems administrator want to be able to have these types of things in jobs, and you as a manager or a hire of programmers want to be able to, be, to present these to your programmings or your potential programmers as things that uh, are important to them. Now, given all of that, and all of those things are things that open source developers value, what other things do open source developers really value? And I found in my 50 years that one of the things they value is visibility of creativity. They take pride in the type of code that they write. 
and therefore they want other people to be able to see it. Now, this isn't necessarily on flashy, what we call competitive features. A lot of times the creativity can be on things like stability of the code, speed of the code, performance of the code, and they want this to be able to be visible to other programmers. They also like to talk to customers and users. Now, if you're in a closed source proprietary environment, a lot of times this doesn't happen because you're not seen as a programmer. Nobody knows your name. But with open source, it's relatively easy for programmers to be known by the customers and users. Now, not every, I will say that not every developer likes to talk with customers and users. Some developers are kind of shy and private. Uh, some customers are not the people you want to talk with. They could be rather abrasive. But for the most part, the ability to talk and interchange ideas with customers and users is something that open source developers like. So how can open source improve a programmer's skills? Uh, one thing that open source does is allow lots of different code to be seen by your programmers. You can see well-written code, see how it works. You can learn from the code that was well-written by other people, other good programmers. Likewise, you know that your code is going to be seen by other coders and not just the people in your group. It's going to be seen by users. And therefore, this pushes for a better coding standard in amongst pro open source programmers. I've dealt with closed source uh, programmers before. A lot of times, some of these people would put some bad comments in the source code about the vendors of the hardware or the users who are making some demands of them. And this was embarrassing when later on, the companies wanted to open up the code and allow other people to see it. And sometimes these were blocking points from uh, companies opening up their code. And what the open source community had to do was under an NDA, go in and remove those bad comments from the code so that it could then be opened up to the general public. Another thing that helps with open source code is open testing. One of the reasons why the Linux kernel was so stable almost from the very beginning was the fact that they would go in and they would change a few things and then publish it. And 10,000 people would pull it down, put it on their system, try it out, and give immediate feedback as to things that worked or did not work. And consequently, the Linux kernel just kept getting better and better until eventually it became 1.0 and beyond. So let's take a look at some case studies about how free and open source software and hardware have changed businesses and changed them from being perhaps a product business into a service or solution business. Now, about 10 years ago, as I was going around talking about free software and open source, I stopped talking about the glories of a programmer being able to look at the source code and I started talking about solutions. I realized that nobody ever buys a piece of hardware. Nobody has a shrine to a piece of hardware on the wall, has a, a print circuit board glued to the wall with two candles on either side. Maybe Steve Wozniak and a C Apple one, but that's worth a lot of money. On the other hand, nobody ever does that for a piece of software either. Nobody has a box of software glued to the wall with the candles on either side, unless their name is Larry Allison and it's Oracle. What they really are buying is a solution. And even if the problem that you're trying to solve is just playing a game, it just so happens that a computer and the internet may be the best way of playing that game. And so about 20 years ago, IBM talked about their hardware 
and their software. They talked about their mainframes. They talked about their server systems. But all of a sudden, they realized that the laptops and small servers only had about a 3 to 5% profit margin. And this is not enough for a company like IBM to survive. So they sold those divisions off to a company called Lenovo. And they took that money and they bought a company called PricewaterhouseCooper that doubled their service department because their service department had a 19 to 20% profit margin. And that was enough to keep IBM alive. So these days, when you go through an airport and you see an advertisement from IBM, all it says is IBM Business Solutions because that is what IBM has become. Yes, they still produce hardware. They produce uh, mainframes and other types of server systems. They do a lot of software development and research, but they use that in their business solution business. Let's take a look at a few more case studies. There is a company that was very close to my house uh, in Nashua, New Hampshire that had a very large piece of software that ran on different operating systems like IBM's MVS, DEX, VMS, Unix systems. And they had five engineers working for this company. From time to time, one of their customers would say, I'd love to have your software working on a different system. But it took the engineers a long time to do the port. And then they had to do quality assurance on it. And both of those things they hated doing. And then the customer might pay two or three copies of the software, but they would get no more revenue from it. So the CEO of the company looked at this and said, well, what can I do to make this better? He said, what would happen if we took the bulk of the software, most of the software, and made that free and open source? If we built a community of people around making that software better and better and porting it to other systems, we'll make that software free of charge. We won't charge anything for it. And so he did that, and there became a large community of people maintaining that software, putting it to different operating systems, and all of this was hosted on the server of this company's business. The people in the company separated out a few pieces of software that were very, very useful for large companies. And they made those closed source and proprietary, but they ran on top of the other software that was free and open source. Whenever a small company pulled the software down, the company would look at that and say, oh, you'll love our software. Congratulations, use it for free, contribute to the community. And sometime when you get bigger, you should talk to us again for these because of these other modules. However, if somebody like the United States military or the government or a large corporation like General Motors pulled the software down, then the company would say, oh, congratulations. You know, we would like to sell you these other pieces that we think would help you out a lot. So if you took a look at what happened here, number one, they reduced their porting costs. They, they just went away. There was very, very few costs associated with porting. Their five engineers were restructured into producing better functionality that ran across all of the ports. The third thing that happened was they reduced their cost of advertising and marketing from 36% to 5%. And all of this created more profit and happier engineers. The next case study I'd like to talk about is a product called Project.net. It is project management software. It was started out as being a closed source proprietary system. It cost about $2,000 a copy because it was very good and people needed it. 
And the company was selling about two copies of the software every quarter. This was not enough to keep the company alive, and they went bankrupt. A friend of mine bought the company, bought the intellectual property, and said, what would happen if I made this open source? Because he realized that about 60% of the people who bought the product also bought service and education because the product was big, it was complex, it was important to their job, to their, their company. So people bought the service and the education if they started using the product. So my friend opened up the code, made it all open source, and 2,000 people a quarter pulled down the code. And 60% of them ended up buying education and service. And so he made more money, more profit than ever. The third one most of you have heard about is Blender. Blender is a 3D creation for movies, games, and architectural walkthroughs of buildings. It started out as a closed source proprietary product. It went bankrupt. The users of it liked it so much that they bought the intellectual property, they bought the code, and they turned it into a nonprofit doing open source. Now it's more successful than ever. As an open source project, they make money by selling training classes, they make money by uh, doing advertising grants and things like that, and it's a very successful project. Here's the last case study I'm gonna talk about. It's in St. Petersburg, Russia. It is a turbine test bed. When you're designing a steam turbine or a water turbine or some other type of turbine, you need to test it out. And so you would send it to one of five turbine test beds. Four of them use proprietary software that was created by a company. And the fifth one used free software to do the same thing. He used Linux as the operating system, Apache as a web server to spread the information to the engineers, GNU plot to plot out the differences between the mechanical engineer, uh, the mechanical engineer and the efficiency, and Tickle TK to draw little diagrams of where the sensors were put and what they were measuring. Now the difference between these two systems was that the end user of the software was not the turbine testbed owner. The end user of the software was actually the engineers designing the turbines. And they were seeing all of these results through their web browser remotely. Every once in a while, they would ask for some little change to the software. And the company that developed it would take 10 months to do even the simplest change. The person in St. Petersburg could change their software and have the, a simple change in three days. So if you're an end user engineer waiting for this change to happen so you can get the information to do your turbine better, having it in three days instead of 10 months is a big thing. So what we're trying to show here is there's a problem. The solution is the software and the hardware. And that open source, a lot of times, can be the best solution rather than proprietary. Now, I'm going to put some of my own observations over 50 years into this. I started working for a company called Western Electric that did a very important set of studies called the Hawthorne Studies. These were the, some of the first studies that studied people in a manufacturing and professional situation trying to see the types of things that affected them. Western Electric at that time made electric light bulbs. And they had people on a production line taking these bulbs and putting them into cardboard boxes. Typically, a person working on this production line would last for one or two weeks. And then they would say, I can't stand it. This job is so boring. I'm going out of my mind and they would leave. 
there was one woman who had been on the job for three years. And, pe and the people who were running the, the production line finally went to her and said, how are you here for three years on this? They didn't say mind numbing, but they, it was that on this job. And she said, oh, well, I look at the light bulb way up the, co the conveyor belt and I pick one out and I think about where that light bulb is going. Maybe it's going to go to the White House. Maybe it's going to go to a palace by a king. Maybe it's going to go to an elementary school. And I bring it down and I pick it up and I put it in the box. And then I look at the next one up the line. And what the people realized was this woman was daydreaming. And the daydreaming was protecting her sanity. And so out of this came the concept of music. The music that you hear in elevators, the music that you hear around. These are things to keep your mind active so you don't go crazy in a dull and boring job. Another example of Western Electric and the Hawthorne was they wanted to study the effect of good illumination on productivity. So they took some people out of a very dirty, dusty, dark assembly line, put them in a little room so they could measure it. And after and they, and they turned up the light so it was brighter. And yes, production went up. They kept turning up the light and the production kept going up until finally the people doing the test would go into the room. It was so bright, they couldn't stand it. Their eyes were hurting. And they said, there's something wrong here. Let's turn down the light. And so they turned down the light and the production shot right out through the roof. They, they said, what's going on? They started talking to the people and the people said, you know, they took us out of this dirty, dark, crappy work situation. They put us in this nice clean, nice clean room. It was quiet. And they started helping us with the light. And maybe they got a little too carried away, but they cared about us. And so the Hawthorne studies realized that a manager trying to make things better for their engineers, for their programmers, for the people in the production line is appreciated and people give their best work. I worked for Bell Labs for a while. Uh, some of our managers noticed that some of the Bell Labs researchers were coming in late, and they didn't like that. And they saw that some of the Bell Labs engineers were leaving early, and they didn't like that. So they installed a time clock to measure and make sure that the engineers arrived on time, went to lunch on time, went home at time. But what happened was they noticed that product productivity went down. And then they realized that the people that were leaving early was because they came in at like four o'clock in the morning. The people that were coming in late was because they were going to stay until 10 o'clock at night. And when they put in the time clock, they threw out that type of honesty in their production. And the engineers just gave them exactly what they paid for which was less than what they had. I had an engineer at Digital Equipment Corporation. I was not their boss. I wasn't even a colleague. I was a product manager who happened to see something that this person had done that was very, very good. I stopped by their cubicle one day, and I said to them, you know, that piece of code you wrote was really good. I just wanted to let you know I liked it. And the man burst into tears because he told me that in the 20 years he'd been working at DEC, not a single time had anybody ever complimented his code. Not his manager, nobody. But he got raises and, and everything, but nobody had pointed out a particular piece of code that they thought he had done a good job with. And that's made... Uh, made me realize that I needed to do this more. One final point is better tools for programmers. Sometimes programmers will see 
a piece of code or, a, or a, maybe a, a proprietary tool or something like that or a better piece of hardware. And management will hold back in purchasing that because they say, oh, it's a lot of money. But if they did the real examination of that and they found out that by getting that tool, their programmer's efficiency overall will go up by 10 or 15% or even 5%. It would be worthwhile. It would be a good deal. So managers, you have to think about your management style and how you are going to win over your programmers. With that, I will stop the presentation.